All right, so we're going to get started here. Today, uh, the hope is that we can get acclimated with the relationships between pressure and volume and moles and temperature. So far, you've already taken the time to examine the FET simulation in groups of two on the computers. Hopefully, you got a clearer picture of these relationships and have even derived them before this presentation. So let's start with a quick example here. We know taking a can of spray paint or any other sealed aerosol can and throwing it in a fire is a horrible idea. Now some of you might say that it's a bad idea because it's flammable and that might be true. But the real danger here is the shrapnel flying away from the can as a result of the increase in pressure in the can. So. This can is already under pressure. It's a sealed container. There are gas particles constantly moving and colliding with the walls of the can. These collisions apply a force and that force is pressure. Now, when we increase the temperature of the can, those gases desire to expand. And when they do, they cause the container to explode. So let's sort of summarize what we did in the uh, FET simulation earlier today. So first of all, for a rigid container, a rigid container, remember, is any container that cannot change its volume. So this would be like a metallic can, like an aerosol can. Okay, so in these cases, ladies and gentlemen, our volume is constant. So as temperature increases, the gas particles collide more with the walls of the container, which causes the force on the walls of the container to more collisions means we have an increase in force. This causes the pressure then, of course, more force, more pressure. So the pressure is going to increase. So if our temperature increases, our pressure increases. Hmm. I wonder what sort of relationship occurs when you have two variables both increasing simultaneously. Let's go back to this rigid container idea once again. Again, a rigid container means we have a constant volume. Our container cannot get bigger, our container cannot get smaller. And also remember, our gases take the volume of the container. So ladies and gentlemen, that means the volume of our gases is going to be constant for this experiment. So in a rigid container, as the number of particles increases, the gas particles collide more with the walls of the container, which cause the force on the walls of the container to increase. Remember, more collisions more force and of course if there's more force there's going to be more pressure oops causes the pressure to increase and again if you think about this logically it should make perfect sense if there's more particles moving there's an increased likelihood of a collision if there is more collisions there is more force if there is more force there is more pressure So, let's talk about these relationships. 
When we're calculating changes in rigid containers, that means we have a constant volume. And ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you already figured out on your own that these relationships we're talking about here are direct relationships. When your pressure, sorry, when your temperature goes up, your pressure must also increase. And again, think about that logically. Remember, temperature is the average kinetic energy of a gas particle, or of any particle for that matter. Okay, and if the temperature is going up, we have more motion. We have more motion, we have a higher likelihood of a collision with the container. More collisions, more force, more force, more pressure. So again, temperature up, pressure up. That's direct. Okay, and it works the other way. Temperature down, it's colder. The particles move slower. There is less likelihood of a collision. Pressure goes down as well. It's a direct relationship. Okay, and as well. Our pressure and our moles are also directly related. Again, think about it logically. If we add more particles to a room, we add more particles to a balloon, we add more particles to a tire, we add more particles to anything, there is going to be more collisions. In the case of a rigid container, of course, if we add more particles, there is going to be more collisions with the wall. Okay, If there's more collisions with the wall, there is an increased amount of pressure. So now let's talk flexible containers. And this, of course, is our things like our tires or our balloons, um, where the walls are allowed to move. Okay, in other words, we have a volume that can change. So in a flexible container, as the temperature increases, the gas particles are going to move faster and they are going to collide more with the walls of the container, which causes the force on the walls of the container to increase. Of course, since the walls are able to move, okay, instead of an increase in force, that, or sorry, increase in pressure, pardon me, the force presses the walls of the container out, and by pressing the walls of the container out, the volume will increase. Okay, and that's going to occur until the pressure within the balloon or whatever this container is, is equivalent to the pressure outside. The pressures must be equal. Okay, let's also look at particles in our flexible container. Again, flexible container thinking balloon. The walls are able to expand and contract, get bigger or smaller. The volume can change. As the number of particles decreases, okay, the gas particles collide less with the walls of the container, which causes the force on the walls of the container to decrease. Okay, since the walls can move, the volume decreases until the pressure is the same as the pressure outside. Again, if there is less pushing on the walls of the container, if there's less pushing inside, that means the atmospheric pressure is going to crunch our balloon down, or whatever our container is, and make it smaller. Okay, so less force in the balloon, the balloon shrinks to compensate. So when we're talking flexible containers, ladies and gentlemen, our volume is able to change. What is constant, though, is our pressure. Our pressure within our balloon always will be equivalent to the pressure outside. Okay, so if it is one atmosphere of pressure outside today, the pressure within the balloon will also be one atmosphere. Okay, our inside and outside pressures must be the same. The pressure stays constant within that balloon at all times. Okay, so uh, if we look at our relationships here, well, of course, the volume and temperature change in the same direction. If we increase our temperature, our particles move faster. They collide more often. They apply a force to the walls of the container and push the container out until the pushing in the container is equivalent to the pushing outside the container. The container stops expanding. Okay, of course, it works the other way. If our particles move slower, they collide less often. They apply less force on the walls of the container. The container shrinks down to compensate for that. Okay, this idea also works directly for volume and moles. Okay, as our moles go up, we add more particles into our container. By placing more particles into our container, there are more collisions with the walls. If there are more collisions with the walls, then there is a greater force on the walls, pushing the walls outward, again, until the pushing on the walls is equivalent to the pushing outside the walls. It stops expanding. And again, it works the other way as well. If there are less 
molecules or less pieces of gas within the container, there's less colliding in the container. If there's less colliding in the container, less force, less force, the balloon will shrink down until the force in the balloon is equivalent to the force outside the balloon. So let's talk how we're going to actually start to solve for these problems. Some things we need to keep in mind. When we're starting to talk temperature here, and again, this is the first time we've talked temperature for gases, we must always use the Kelvin scale. Uh, we talked about this much earlier on, about one of the benefits of using, using Kelvin, pardon me, is that we can avoid negative signs. Okay, it is very important that we avoid negatives because if we start to use negatives for temperature, there are possibilities that we could solve for negative volumes and negative pressures. So if we think about that logically, well, negative pressures would mean negative collisions. That makes absolutely no sense. Negative volume means negative space. Again, it makes no sense. So we're going to be using Kelvin to make sure we do not get any negative answers. Keep that in mind while we're calculating. So let's talk how we're going to go ahead and solve these problems here. Um, anytime we go ahead and do one of these problems, we need to, again, use our tables. Uh, but before we do that, we need to think about what sort of container are we working with. Okay, If it's a rigid, metallic sort of container that cannot expand, it cannot contract, we want to identify it as rigid, having a constant volume. Okay, If it's a balloon or some other flexible container, well, then that, of course, means it can expand and contract. Our volume can go up or down. Okay, That means our pressure must be the constant. The second thing we want to do again is fill in our table. What do we know? What are our initial and final conditions? And what do we expect to happen uh, to our unknown variable? From there, we'll set up our ratios to get us our expected change. We'll multiply and we'll solve. So here's our first problem. A two liter metal box filled with nitrogen gas at three atmospheres, is at three atmospheres, pardon me, and originally stored at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. It is heated until the metal is hot to the touch, approximately 98 Celsius. What is the pressure inside the box? So first of all, is this rigid? Is this flexible? Of course, it's a metal box. So we know that if it is a metal box, of course, it's rigid, meaning our volume is going to be constant. Okay, so it's two liters and two liters. That's not changing. So that means we're looking at pressure and temperature in this particular problem. So now let's go through and identify what do we know, what are we going for. So we have a metal box filled with nitrogen gas at three atmospheres and originally at room temperature. So our pressure initially is going to be three atmospheres. We also know that there's an original temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. But remember the previous slide we just spoke about, of course our temperature cannot be in Celsius, we need Kelvin. If you'll remember, we can take our temperature in Celsius, Celsius pardon me, and we can add 273 to get Kelvin. So 25 Celsius is just 298 Kelvin. So now we need to forge ahead here and figure out what do we know from our final conditions and what are we solving for. So we find that it's heated within the container to approximately 98 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we have a final temperature. Again, we cannot use Celsius, so we use our trick of adding 273 to get Kelvin. In doing so, we get 371 Kelvin as our final temperature. So I record that in my final temperature spot. Okay, so that means, ladies and gentlemen, that our pressure is our unknown. So before we go ahead and solve, we need to ask ourselves, what do we expect to happen to the pressure? Well, think back to our previous slides here. Remember, what happened to our temperature? Our temperature started at 298, and then it went to 371. Our temperature increased. Our particles are moving faster. If our particles are moving faster, they're colliding more with the walls of the container. More collisions, more force, more force, more pressure. So we would expect our pressure to go up. Okay, so it's going to go up from three atmospheres to what? Well, remember, we need to take our three atmospheres and we're going to multiply it by our factor here. And well, how do we know what factor it is? Well, remember, we're going to use our ratio of temperatures. Okay, and there's only two ways this can go. We can do 298 over 371 Kelvin, or we can go the other way. We can go 371 over 298. The question is, which of those ratios is going to cause an increase in the three atmospheres? 
should be pretty evident, pretty obvious, that if we go with 371 over 298 Kelvin, we get that increase in our answer. So from there, of course, if you look at it, notice the Kelvins cancel out, so we still have atmospheres as our unit, and everything mathematically works here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 3.0, and we're going to multiply that by 371 over 298. And we get 3.7 atmospheres. Again, I go to two significant figures because my given has two significant figures. And I label my answer with atmospheres because that's my unit. And again, does this make sense? Absolutely. We expected an increase in our uh, pressure. And that is, in fact, what we get, an increase in pressure. Let's try another one. In this other problem, we have a 4.5 liter balloon at one atmosphere, and it's originally containing 0.20 moles of helium gas. We're going to open it and let out 0.05 moles of helium. We want to know what the new volume of the balloon is. So we ask ourselves, what kind of container do we have? It's a balloon, okay? That means it can expand, it can contract. That also means then that our volume is variable and our pressure is constant. So through the entire problem here, we know that our pressure must be 1.0 atmospheres. So now let's poke around and see what else we can find. We know that our one atmosphere, a 4.5 liter balloon, originally is our volume. Okay, it's going to contain 0 0.20 moles, 0 0.20 moles of helium. There's our initial conditions. Fantastic. That means we need to find one more condition here to figure out what we have and what we're solving for. Well, here's the trick. We're letting 0 0.05 moles of helium out. Okay, so the question is, well, how much or how many moles are inside the balloon? Well, you got to be careful here because what we really need to do is subtract 0 0.05 from 0 0.20. And the answer is 0.15 moles is what remains. Okay, so that means then, of course, that we're going to be solving for volume. So now we need to fill in what is our expected change for our volume here. Let's think about it logically. Of course, our pressure is not changing. Our pressure is constant. So let's take a look over here at our moles. If we look at our moles, well, our amount of gas goes down from 0 0.20 to 0.15. If the amount of particles goes down, what's going to happen to the amount of collisions? Well, of course, less particles means less collisions. Less collisions means less force. Less force means the walls of our container are going to be pushed in, and our volume should decrease. If our volume decreases, we need to ask ourselves, what ratio should we be multiplying by to find out what that decrease is. Well, remember, our decrease is proportional to our decrease in moles. So let's take a look at it. We have 0 0.20 and 0.15. What ratio could we use here that's going to get us a decrease in 4.5? Well, of course, hopefully, um, it's very evident to you that if we take 0.15 moles over 0 0.20 moles, we get a fraction or a ratio that will decrease our value of 4.5 liters. So we take 4.5, we multiply it by 0.15 uh, divided by 0.20, and then we will have our answer. So let's see here. 4.5 times 0.15 divided by 0 0.20. Let's see. We get 3. 0.4 liters. And again, if you take a look at this, this should make sense. We have two significant figures because our given has two significant figures. Our answer is labeled as liters because, of course, our moles cancel out. Um, and also, double check our work here. We expected a decrease in our volume. Our volume started at 4.5. It ends at 3.4. So that does, in fact, reflect a decrease in our volume.